No one could ever have imagined that the unsinkable Titanic would collide with an iceberg. Except for one man, William Thomas Stead. Well, not directly, of course. It's not like he jolted out of bed one day, envisioning the fall of the Titanic. Rather, he wrote an empowering short story called How the Mail Steamer Went Down in Mid-Atlantic by a Survivor on March 3, 1886, 26 years before Titanic sank. Okay, let's do a super quick recap. Titanic was traveling from Southampton to New York in April 1912 in the North Atlantic. The ship hit an iceberg, and less than three hours later, it was completely underwater. Out of 2,208 people on board, just 706 survived due to the limited number of lifeboats and icy cold water. Another passenger ship, Carpathia, heard the distress call, picked up the survivors, and brought them safely to New York. The short story William Stead wrote was about Thomas, a British sailor, who got on a passenger liner bound for the U.S. At one point, the protagonist realized there weren't enough lifeboats for everyone on board the ship in case something happened. A couple of days later, heavy fog covered everything in sight. Luck was not on the liner's side, and it collided with a stray ship, just like Titanic struck an iceberg. Only 200 out of the 916 people made it safely to the U.S. The main character managed to survive by jumping into the water and climbing into one of the lifeboats. Now, you'd think that the story riled up everyone in the industry to add extra lifeboats on ships. But sadly, it received very little attention when it was published. Even more tragically, William Thomas Stead was on Titanic when it sank, and he didn't make it. The survivors who knew Stead mentioned that he had always been cheerful and had loved to chat during meals. He complimented the ship's design and how sturdy it was. Witnesses also talked about how he had been helpful when the ship had been sinking, having given his life jacket to someone else. He was a journalist by profession and was on his way to New York for a ceremony. One of his most important contributions to modern journalism was the use of illustrations in every newspaper article. He also introduced newspaper interviews, and they're still used to this day along with illustrations. But this story wasn't the only published work that predicted the disaster. Morgan Robertson was an author and former ship captain who wrote short stories and novels. His most notable novella is The Wreck of the Titan. It's also known as Futility. The book was written in 1898, 14 years before Titanic. It was a fictional story about the Titan, an ocean liner similar to Titanic, which was crossing the North Atlantic. It's also a coincidence that Titan was just as fast as Titanic and shared many other similarities, like size and design. The book described it as unsinkable and the largest ship to hit the ocean at the time. That's what they said about Titanic, too. Another eerie similarity was the limited number of lifeboats it had. The story took place in April, and that's when Titanic set off on its journey and hit the iceberg. The Titan story also mentioned that barely anyone had survived that horrible accident. Unlike Stead's story, the protagonist of Robertson took a different path. The Titan sinking happened somewhere halfway through the book, so after the accident, the main character went on with his life. The book was brought back into the spotlight after the Titanic disaster. How could someone describe the events that took place almost a decade later so accurately? Many started to believe Robertson could see the future. But the reality was that Robertson knew his way around a ship. It was easy for him to write down the nitty-gritty of things without doing more research. Realistically, one of the biggest threats for ships at that time was hitting an iceberg or colliding with other ships. The next story sounds somewhat mysterious. Once, Alex McKenzie heard a voice that warned him not to board Titanic. But when he turned around, there was nobody there. As he continued walking, the voice spoke to him again. But this time, it was louder and more distinct. He took the warning seriously and decided to cancel the trip and go back to Glasgow, Scotland, his hometown. His grandparents weren't too happy to find him back home instead of on Titanic. After all, the ticket was very expensive. That disappointment very soon disappeared when they heard that the ship had struck an iceberg. John Coffey was a member of the crew of Titanic, but he decided to ditch the ride when the ship stopped at his hometown in Queenstown, Ireland. 
His inner voice told him to get off the liner, and he did. He was only 23 at the time, and for someone his age, it could be a major career boost and an opportunity to grow. Despite the horrible tragedy, the guy signed to work with the RMS Mauritania just months after the Titanic sinking. Talk about commitment! Some added info was revealed about what may have contributed to the fall of Titanic. The constructors insisted that the ship was unsinkable. But many people later theorized that the vessel's steel plates had been too frail for the freezing Atlantic water. It may have caused the rivets to pop, allowing ocean water to seep inside. Another theory is that there may have been a fire in the hull of the Titanic that had been raging for three weeks before the voyage. The fire softened the steel, allowing the iceberg to cut through it like a hot knife through butter. Some pictures before the ship set off on its journey show black marks on the hull, which could have been caused by fire. Either way, the iceberg would have caused significant damage in any case, no matter if there was a fire or not. Some people also blame those who designed the Titanic. The ship was built with large joints at the bottom, which probably snapped easily during the collision. Of course, these are all theories. But we know for a fact that the iceberg was the main character of this drama, and that the works of Stead and Robertson should have been taken seriously. Either way, this should be a lesson for the future, helping to prevent similar tragic accidents. By the way, ocean liners and passenger ships wouldn't exist if it hadn't been for Thomas Newcomet. In 1712, he invented a steam engine that was so strong it could produce enough energy to power a ship. And a century later, in 1819, the first steamship traveled across the Atlantic Ocean to Liverpool, UK. It only took the vessel 29 days to cross the ocean. The passenger ship industry boomed in the early 1900s when it became easier for people to move to America or go on holidays. As decades rolled by, the use of aircraft stole the spotlight from passenger ships since planes were faster and more efficient. Nowadays, it's quite rare for a passenger ship to collide with anything in open water. Modern technologies can detect anything that can pose a threat and even predict stormy weather. Cruise ships these days are giants compared to the vessels of Titanic's era. Modern ships can carry almost twice the number of passengers and have amenities folks back then could only dream of. Most cruise ships these days have several restaurants to choose from, multiple swimming pools, and game rooms to catch a break. If you're in the mood for some fun, you can watch live performances. Don't forget about the helicopter pad, because why not? Don't worry if you start feeling unwell. The in-house doctors are always there to help any passenger in need. And these ships are only going to get bigger. Putting Titanic and a modern cruise ship side by side is like comparing a corgi to a Doberman. Back then, Titanic was the biggest and most cutting-edge vessel anyone could dream of. So, who knows what the future of cruise ships can hold? We might even have entire cities floating around. Hmm, that would be a really big boat. It was 1949. In the world of science, Albert Einstein had already become famous. And what do all celebrities have? Well, fans, of course. An English engineer was brave enough to write to the great Albert Einstein himself. Unfortunately, historians didn't find the original letter, but they recently discovered Einstein's reply. It is short, one page only, but the content is fascinating. He wrote of animals that possess super senses. Sounds out of this world, but it actually isn't. More than 70 years ago, Einstein wrote down the following. It is thinkable that the investigation of the behavior of migratory birds and carrier pigeons might someday lead to the understanding of some physical process that is not yet known. Back then, this was just a hunch. Biology and physics were just beginning to explain the behavior of animals. Take for example, bats' echolocation. An American professor of zoology was the first to describe how bats navigate. In English, there is a phrase, as blind as a bat. And in some languages, the name for the species literally translates as blind mouse. This is because bats don't have sharp and colorful vision like humans do. Now this doesn't mean they need to visit an optometrist. Bats can see pretty well in pitch black conditions, but they don't use eyesight to navigate. Bats use echolocation. 
To understand what it's like, tell me, have you ever been inside a cave and yelled out your name? Did you notice how the walls responded to you? This is an echo. The loud sound you made simply reflected off the hard surfaces around you. This happens in any space with solid walls, such as a canyon, a mountain range, or a well. Sounds can't bounce off soft surfaces. Yell your name in a room full of pillows, and you won't get a reply. Bats use this echo to get around. The animal produces a high-frequency sound through its mouth or nose. Then they wait for the echo to come back, and voila! They have an accurate 3D image of the world around them. Bats' echolocation is so sophisticated that it can detect an object the width of a human hair. Now that's impressive. Scientists estimate that 70% of bat species have the ability to echolocate. So bats are not blind after all. But we didn't know all this until the 1940s. That's when the American scientists coined the term echolocation. This was a major breakthrough in biology at the time. Einstein probably knew about it, so it served as a clue for him. Another hint was radar technology. You know how in airports they have that round screen with the tiny dots that represent airplanes' positions? Yes, that's a radar. And it works using the same principle bats use to orient themselves. The development of radar as we know it today began only in the 1930s. At the time he wrote the letter, Einstein couldn't have known how this technology would change the world. The radar approach for civilian aircraft appeared in 1952, three years before Albert Einstein passed away. But his letter also mentions bees. Einstein wrote that a new kind of sensory perception would be revealed through the behavior of bees. What did he mean by this? What is the extraordinary ability that bees have? Like bats, they're champions of navigation. But they don't use echolocation. Bees possess the ability to detect the Earth's magnetic field. It's generated in our planet's interior, and it extends into space. You know that image of Earth with circular lines around it? That's it. The magnetic field shields us from the sun's dangerous radiation. Without it, there would be no life on our blue planet. And there's another perk to Earth's magnetic field, navigation. Since the 12th century, Europeans have been using compasses to get around. That's how we discovered much of our planet. These devices contained a magnetized needle that rotates in the direction of the magnetic north. Even today, when you open Google Maps, you can still see the symbol of this needle. Click on it, and the map rotates north. But a bee doesn't have a smartphone or a compass. So how do they know which way is north? Researchers believe that these animals have tiny receptors inside their abdomens. They consist of iron granulates that act as mini compasses. Just imagine that. Bees are born with navigational devices inside their bodies. And all humans have to download a map on their phones. Bees also use the sun and light to navigate. They can travel up to 5 miles from the hive when looking for food. And they always find their way back. Bees are the ultimate flight planners. And they're not the only ones. Dogs are also excellent pathfinders. Take for example Pablo. He was a two-year-old hunting terrier. One day, Pablo went camping with his owners in the French Alps. During a stop, the canine went missing. At this point, a human would go to the nearest house to get help. But not Pablo. The lively mutt immediately started walking home. In just a couple of days, he returned to his owners. His home was more than 200 miles away to the south from the spot he got lost in. That's three days of non-stop walking for a human being. How did Pablo pull off this stunt? The same way bees do. The Earth's magnetic field. Before such cases, scientists believe that dogs only use their sense of smell to navigate. Then, experiments show that dogs don't retrace their steps. They use a different path to find their home. Since they obviously didn't use GPS, the only other possibility was the Earth's magnetic field. If you think that such animal behavior is fishy, that's because it is, quite literally. Fish are among the most skilled navigators in the animal kingdom. Salmon are the best example. They hatch in freshwater rivers and start a long journey to the North Atlantic Ocean. They often cover a stretch longer than the I-80 Interstate Freeway. That's the driving distance from New Jersey to California. The journey can last years, 
But it's the end that is the most impressive part. They turn back and head the same way to breed again. There is a compass of sorts in the salmon's nose. Scientists found small deposits of a magnetic mineral in the fish's sinuses. In fact, salmon's sense of smell is a thousand times more sensitive than a dog's. Finally, we have migratory birds Einstein mentioned in his letter. In Asia, there are geese that cover distances of over 3,000 miles during the migration season. Scientists agree that their sense of smell can't get them that far. Biologists have tried to explain birds' excellent navigation skills in various ways. Some believe they use the sun and moon to find their way. Others claim birds use landmarks to orient themselves. And then there is the explanation that involves the Earth's magnetic field. Researchers notice a small spot on the beaks of pigeons. It contains a magnetic rock they believe helps the animals navigate. Bees, dogs, fish, and birds. Did you also spot a pattern emerging? That's because there is definitely a link between all these species when it comes to navigation. But after decades of research, science hasn't been able to fully understand how animals sense the Earth's magnetic field. The mystery lives on, and it only gets deeper. You've probably heard that cats can sense an earthquake. This happened in a cat cafe in Osaka in 2018. Just 10 seconds before the ground started to shake violently, the felines there seemed agitated, as if something had scared them. Did they feel the tremors deep underneath the surface of the Earth? One explanation is that they can sense the planet's magnetic field. This means they can feel minor tremors that humans cannot register until it's too late. At the end of his short letter, Einstein mentioned that further research was needed to explain this strange phenomenon. The famous German was a theoretical physicist. Biology wasn't his primary field of interest. And to explain how animals navigated, all sorts of scientists needed to get involved. Einstein didn't want to discuss something he wasn't an expert on. A huge meteorite enters our atmosphere, causing an explosion of catastrophic proportions. All forms of life on Earth cease to exist. A giant wave of fire wraps around the planet several times until only ash and dust remain of the green landscape. But then again, there's another option for our planet's future. The sun could swallow it. Wait, 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 wait. Who is this? In the course of its evolution, our star will keep expanding. Am I the only one hearing this voice? Until it gets so big that it just swallows our planet without even noticing it. Hey, buddy, that's my video. I don't think so. Okay, all right, I'll share it with you. But let's not look that far into the future. Whatever you say, buddy. How about the fact that the Earth will soon have rings? Like Saturn? Almost. Saturn's rings are made of dust and ice. Yeah, I've heard about that. Thousands of years ago, something really mysterious happened in Saturn's orbit. The planet's gravity tore one of its satellites apart. Yes, Saturn is a gas giant. It's 95 times heavier than Earth. So it has stronger gravity. It attracted a small moon from its orbit to its surface. Then, it was torn apart from the inside by tidal forces, like the ones between Earth and Moon. Many huge fragments stuck in Saturn's orbit. Some scientists say there was a collision of two moons there. They crashed into each other like billiard balls. As a result, both cosmic bodies turned into a pile of debris and blocks of ice. No matter how they got there, this debris started circling Saturn. They collided with each other, turning into smaller rocks. It was a kind of cosmic blender. Rocks gradually ground into dust, and huge blocks of ice turned into small crystals. On average, the objects are in the same ratio to these rings as a human fingernail to a school bus. And soon, similar rings will appear around Earth. But how? I mean, we have the moon, and it's hard to imagine that it could break apart at any moment. Plus, we don't have another moon to recreate the same collision in our orbit. Space junk. We have a lot of it. We started launching spacecraft into Earth's orbit in about 1957, and it almost always follows the same scenario. Ah, yes. The rocket consists of several parts. A booster, or even several of them. The second stage of the rocket and a cargo, which is contained in a capsule at the end of the rocket. The booster accelerates the rocket to almost orbit and then undocks. 
The second stage fires up the engines and climbs even higher to get the cargo into orbit. Then the second stage undocks as well, and the cargo capsule releases the satellite or space probe into outer space. Yes, the first and the second stages of the rocket in the cargo capsule were disposable. That means they stayed in Earth's orbit. Over time, our planet attracted them. They entered the atmosphere and burned up because of friction with the air. But many objects keep orbiting our planet for decades. As of 2021, there are about 170 million space debris objects in our orbit. These are parts of spacecraft, like the bolts used to undock rocket stages. There are also old artificial satellites, operating ones, functioning spacecraft, and debris from collisions that had already happened. Oh, I've heard about that. In 2009, two satellites collided with each other. Both satellites were destroyed. They shattered into about 600 pieces of different sizes. Yes, and these sharp metal fragments are flying in orbit at about 6 miles per second. So they could make a trip from New York to London in less than 10 minutes. Yeah, that's about the same speed at which our rockets fly. And that's about 45 times faster than commercial airplanes. So these fragments have a lot of energy. As they collide with each other, they shatter and become smaller. Just like the moon debris around Saturn. Exactly. But a bunch of metal debris orbiting faster than the speed of sound can damage our spacecraft, right? Yes. The International Space Station has already turned on its engines to maneuver once to avoid a collision with a cloud of space debris. Sharp metal parts can damage the hull of the space station or even puncture it. Then the ISS, worth about $150 billion, would be destroyed. So if we keep throwing debris into orbit, we could really give our planet the rings. And then they will be visible even during the day. They will reflect sunlight, just like the moon. And if you look out the window, you'll see beautiful stripes interrupted by the shadow that the Earth casts. It's an amazing view. Do you want to see an even more unusual one? Imagine that our Sun has increased in size by 10 times. And that process is happening right now. Our star is a giant boiler burning hydrogen. It's continually heating up, and every billion years, the Sun gets 10% brighter and creates more heat. It'll heat the Earth more, and eventually, the oceans and seas of our planet will begin to evaporate. Thick clouds will completely cover the sky, turning Earth into a giant greenhouse. Our home will look like Venus. Looks like humanity will no longer be able to live on Earth. What will we do then? Well, we'll load all the humans and animals into spaceships and move to Mars. At that point, the Sun will have warmed it up nicely. Water and carbon dioxide deep in the planet's interior will begin to evaporate and create an atmosphere there. This will cause a greenhouse effect and warm up the planet enough for you to wear shorts there. And then we'll watch the Earth become a lifeless rock with acid clouds like Venus from the surface of Mars. Yep, but in about 7 billion years, the Sun will start to expand even more and become a red giant. In this phase, it'll become 256 times wider than it is now. So it will completely swallow Mercury and Venus, and the edge of the star will lie just in the orbit of Earth. So our planet will just drown in the hot plasma on the sun's surface? Eh, maybe. But when a star burns so much fuel, it loses weight. And so, the sun's gravitational field will weaken as well. So it won't keep the planets of the solar system as close to itself anymore. Perhaps our planet's orbit will become wider, and then Earth will become the first planet near the sun. Some scientists believe that, at this time, Saturn's moon Titan may gain conditions suitable to become a new home for humanity. Then, the Sun will begin to shed its upper layers. It'll lose mass and gravity dramatically. This will plunge the solar system into chaos. Some planets will collide with each other. Others may just fly away into the far dark space. It would be a game of cosmic billiards. Exactly. And the final stage of the Sun's life is a white dwarf. Then our star will become the size of Earth. The planets that survive won't get enough heat from the white dwarf, and its light will gradually fade over billions and trillions of years. Another challenge that awaits Earth in the distant future has a galactic scale. Ah, the collision of the Milky Way and Andromeda. Bingo! Right now, the Andromeda galaxy is moving toward us at 60 miles per second. You could make a trip around the globe at that speed in just six minutes. Yeah, you can already see the stars and gas of Andromeda Galaxy in the night sky with an unaided eye at 2.5 million light years from Earth. And in 4 billion years from now, the galaxies will begin the process of merging. No one could be 100% sure about what will happen to the Earth. 
It could be total chaos when the stars and nebulae of both galaxies collide. Then supernova explosions would go off everywhere. Like fireworks. But this is extremely unlikely to happen. The concentration of stars and space objects in galaxies is very low. The distances between them are gigantic. It's like if you took a handful of sand and scattered it all over the planet. The most likely scenario is that by the time the two galaxies do collide, there will be no liquid water on the hot surface of Earth. That would mean the end to all terrestrial life. Scientists believe it can happen in about 3.75 billion years.